Welcome to the August 2nd special edition Insider Access Briefing. Tonight we're going to have a bit of a different talk. Of course, it's a special edition as I'm making the first portion of this open to the public. Uh, just as a reminder to everybody who's watching or, or listening, uh, the reason that I first decided to get on Twitter, or I suppose X now, uh, continue calling it Twitter for the time being, is actually because I saw a lot of misinformation, drove me crazy. I had an old account and then got hacked. Came back, saw a lot of misinformation, saw a lot of just uh, absolute nonsense and, and not just unprofessional, but pure nonsense. And I decided, okay, so I want to share a little bit more. And then I felt, hey, this is a great way to connect with, with retail uh, and give a little bit back. You know, I tell a little bit more of my uh, journey and life story to becoming a professional, getting in the space and how that all unfolded and sort of how I see things in a different video. So I won't exhaust that. I want to get to something more important. The title of this video is Trading Without Levels. And I think this is really helpful for everyone. Of course, this is a recap for insiders and we're gonna break into the private session uh, at the end of this video, of course. So the first portion is to the public, but trading without levels. So what do I mean by that? So generally, when you when you think about people who trade or the sort of the nonsense you, you hear on online, and I, I frequently say it's a lot of people playing guesswork or shapes and patterns is it has to be this level and there has to be this, uh, I always see this, image circulating that says no, no, no setup, no trade, and it's just a bunch of patterns, right? And the patterns really don't mean anything if they're not coupled with other information. And we want to get into that today. So I'm going to talk about uh, specifically the market action that we saw in the QQQ, and we're going to look at the SPY specifically and what we had set up via Insider Access. So the uh, this idea that, you know, if you look at a pattern, that's going to give you the setup, the bull flag, the bear flag. Just so everybody knows, I'm very heavy on technical analysis. You know, if you're classically trained, I call it classically trained, maybe people have different terms for it, then you don't have any sort of dogma or zealotry. You actually combine everything. And technical analysis can be very powerful when it aligns with other data. And what you'll see, what insiders have seen, just today I posted a double top, I posted a reverse head and shoulders, I posted multiple trend lines looking at data. And sometimes what I do is I say, this is gonna work in conjunction with the following other data that we could see this technical data will be supported. And other times they say, actually, we're gonna do the opposite. We see a bull flag, we're going short because it's gonna fail and it's just gonna trap all these people who don't know what they're talking about. And that's the problem with only following it. I bet anybody can take a look. You can find just as many patterns that work out as that don't, right? But the thing is the ones that work out get promoted and celebrated and everybody tries to put on this illusion of like, see, you gotta just read it and know the levels. Um, I'll tell you this much. And I give this example to insiders as well all the time. If to tomorrow morning, Jerome Powell came out and said we were raising 75 basis points on an emergency hike, or there was some macroeconomic event, or we saw like a shock to shock loss in earnings uh, on the Apple earnings, the markets will go down. The markets will tank, right? The worst, of course, being some disastrous event. And of course, Chair Powell making a decision, but no one will care about your level. No one cares about your chart or your descending triangle or your, you know, hexagon on a three-dimensional plane, whatever you're looking at or whatever quote on level you have means nothing. That's why you have to understand when setups are valid and what's going on with the markets. And that's what we're going to talk about in today's um, today's special session here. So we're actually going to port over to the SPY and I'm going to pull something up really quickly. So for the SPY, what we were talking about with an insider access is we're combining data. So on the technical front, right? Before I kind of get into some of the images that I want to show everybody on the technical front, what I discussed with insiders and videos, and I was sort of pounding the table about this, meaning I was being redundant and repetitive. And I mentioned it again in emails. I had it in a video. Then I mentioned it in discord. Sometimes I'm repetitive because I want to make sure everybody's hundred percent locked into some data. And that doesn't involve guesswork. It's very specific of what we're looking at. What I noted is from a technical standpoint and from a fundamental standpoint, we saw breadth deterioration within the markets. We saw cyclical peaks, uh, bullish in investor sentiment was reaching a high. And so that gave us the setup for weakness. And we've been talking about August weakness. I said there, we were gonna have a correction in August. We're gonna have periods of weakness in August. We're gonna have a challenged earnings period. Uh, and this is great because all the insiders are watching this as well. So if this was nonsense and baloney, people would say, hey, that's, he never said anything about any of that. We have multiple videos on it. So this was important to know coming into August, you know, we were in a lot of catch up trades and I'll discuss that again. It's a it's the last in first out principle. I want to explain that first. 
So of course, breadth deterioration is pretty straightforward. Cyclical peaks, pretty straightforward. Why does high bullish investor sentiment play as a technical evaluation element? It's the last in first out principle. It just basically means, so take a look here. Let's just look at the SPY, right? What if you bought it, um, or you know, we'll pull up the QQQ because there's been more volatility, even easier example. If you were the last in here on a chase trade, right? And you bought at the peak, let's say you bought at 387. Well, when it gets down to, let's say 375, that could trigger your stop loss and you're out, right? So that fervor, that bullish investor sentiment when we're playing catch up in these sort of FOMO trades, it can trigger selling. And there is an actual fundamental reason for that is because why would you be the first out? Because your stop loss is triggered. Compare that to someone who bought it, let's just say a couple weeks ago, it's 362, right? They don't have to exit. There's no panic to exit at 376. They could take some profits off as they pull back if they're scaling out, but there's no panic because you're still in profit. But last in is generally the first out, right? Because if you're the last in, you have the highest cost base. So this isn't technical furu stuff where like, bro, it's just the, the psychology you gotta do it in like, it's this thing that people do. That's nonsense. I can't stand it when people say things that they can't qualify technically, professionally and speaking to actual price action and fundamentals and data when we look at the bank accounts and see how your, what your P&L looks like. So you understand the general last in first out principle. And because we saw this catch up FOMO trade, we saw extensions and we also talked about valuations. How do we know that people are playing catch up? Because we're extending past fundamental valuations. We're stretching. It's called stretching fundamental valuations. When fundamentals are stretched, that means we're paying a little bit of a higher premium. I mean, if you strip out the super seven, if you will, the S&P multiple doesn't look as bad, you know, if you compare it to where we are historically, but we're a little bit stretched with the top seven, set up the market for a pullback. And we know that August is a bit of a lighter month. We see the European managers, they tend to take their vacations. So let's talk about the trading without levels now that you understand a lot of the setup. So what we discussed was, and I'm gonna pull up an image here, was we wanted to watch ADP data coming in negative. We have the Bank of Japan, ADP data, and we were looking at yields. Our trigger, our level for today, for insider access wasn't a price. It was, we're gonna get bad ADP data. If we get bad ADP data, ADP data, we knew that was a selling point, And we also had selling points coming in from yields, right? And that's a 10 year yield and I'll explain. So here we are, we call them robot projections. We have a little bit of fun in Discord. I took this screenshot earlier. So the 10 year yield moved up, broke 4% triggered selling, hit 4.05% new wave of selling, now 4.096. And what do we say here? No, many big names are selling off today. I stated this word for word in last night's email at four, 4.05 and 4.1%. Those are our triggers for the 10% sell off. And I even quoted a piece from last night's email. I repeated it over and over in the video. Then in the email, uh, I usually add an email with a video and just say, you know, here's the outline of tonight's video. And here's just some important reminders. As a final reminder, keep an eye on the ADP market reaction to the downgrade and the 10 year yields exceeding 4% tomorrow. So. Why is that important? Well, let's start to break it down. What happened today? As we hit over 4%, I'm gonna pull up the next screenshot. Banger trading day or whatever you wanna call it. I'm trying to use the cool cool guy terms for everybody who's used to the regular Twitter for us. So this was a follow-up, of course, at 11.06 after we'd had a lot of selling. If last night's email didn't make it clear, they should have driven it home. This is a huge, this is a sell-off. This is a killer day. We broke 4.1% at 11.40 um, Eastern Standard Time and the SPY sold off immediately. That's about as exact as an entry as there can be, not on price, but what we did is we watched the tenure. And once you saw the tenure trigger 4%, we knew selling. 4.05% selling, 4.1% selling. So we weren't looking at some level on a page, and you know this proves that point. And this wasn't something that I came up with guesswork today. I had three intervals, four, 4.05 and 4.1%. I'm gonna show you exactly how they worked. And I'll explain to, to those of you who don't understand why that's important and maybe help because that's, that's the first thing that I set out to do is just help reach back and help people understand what to really do. Because all I saw was pattern chart, bro, check it out, Patreon, Discord, follow me, right? That's all I saw. That's fine, get people to follow you, but the quality of your information has to be there. You have to have a firm understanding of the markets and it's not all just technical, that's nonsense, again. Technical elements fail. We know that. I could, anything can happen tomorrow and every level will get crushed, right? There was no magical level. These intervals happened as the yields moved up, right? So why is that important? Really quickly, before we get into a little bit more, why is it important? Isn't that just another level? No, the reason that the 10-year yield, that yields in general, put negative pressure down on equities is it's simple. 
you can buy a treasury. Let's say you could buy a treasury or a bond that yields 4.1%, right? And the treasuries are the benchmark to weigh against uh, the markets. If I can get 4.1% or 4.5 or let's say 5%, I have to compare that to what I can get from the stock markets, right? Now, this is what I look at as free money. This is a risk-free premium, right? This is my risk-free return. I know I can get 4.1%. Let's just assume that's the number and no higher because there's a two year and the 10, right? Uh, and, there, and there's others. Then I have to look back and say, hmm, is it worth the risk? Let's say I'm investing in Apple and Apple projects, I don't know, eight to 10% a year. I say, okay, well, eight to 10% growth would be better than 4.1%, but I take big risks. Anything can happen with Apple. The markets can crash, Apple can come tumbling down. So it's not a matter of just saying 8% is better than four. What's better? 8% with big risks that you might get 8%, you might get 5%, you might get 3%, and you might even lose. You don't have a guarantee. Or do I just park my money and get my 4.1% guaranteed? That's why yields are so powerful because when you're looking at billions of dollars and where fund managers are gonna go, there is a benchmark. As we move up, more capital will be allocated into safe money. It'll be parked into safe money, right? Particularly when you look at our sort of economic circumstances, we are in that odd sideways period. The rates are still high from the Fed. That's why yields are so high and there are risks. So I, wanna, I wanted everybody just to understand that. That's why we're running with this, but you don't just look at yields. We had a good storm today. We're looking at ADP data. I think I, uh, I mentioned that here, right? Was the ADP data? Yeah, ADP right there. ADP data came in hot, we know that. So that's a negative for the market. So we had that piling on as we're hitting our four, 4.05 and 4.1. Let's see what happens. So we know that, I'm gonna pull these up. So you can pull this up anywhere. You could like, you can get it through some of your brokers, some can't. So I've told everybody, you just look online. You can pull up um, the 10 year online, not all brokers show it, but this is an easy one taken from Wall Street Journal. It's a WSJ website. So this was at 1039. We're at 4.099. So I'm just showing you what happened at our final wave, The just how exact, exact the 4.1% level, or not level, but the yield was in triggering the markets. There's no pattern, there's no bull flag, there's no key level here, bro. There's no supply and resistance zone. And again, I use all of those and everybody knows that. I just flooded in with multiple different technical analysis. We did a full analysis of Apple, pre-earnings, Amazon, pre-earnings, charts, technical patterns, but you have to understand the market holistically. You can't stay married to one thing. There's no zealotry. The only thing you should be attached to is trying to be successful, make money, right? Unless you get paid and sponsored by team technical analysis or fundamental or options flow, great, then, then do that. But if that doesn't pay you, learn everything and understand the markets because that's how a professional works, right? 10.39 a.m., uh, this is August 2nd, right? We're at 4.099. And I explained that I'm not one of those big, oh, the algos, the algos. Most people have no idea. And some little kid on Twitter is not gonna figure out algorithms. I'm sorry, I know it sounds good and it's exciting, to think that it could be someone's cracked the code, these multi-billion dollar Wall Street codes and some kid uh, or some guy, you know, who four months ago had no idea what stock markets was and he learned something and decided he was gonna be a furu has cracked the code. It doesn't work that way, guys, right? But I know that at 4.1%, given the variables right now, that will trigger some automatic selling, that will trigger auto selling. To what extent, you know, is it gonna be massive? It will be more than sufficient, in my view, to merit the risk and a risk meaning Nothing's ever a guarantee, but there's a very high probability such that I kept sending out the emails and the videos and repeated it this morning. So 1039, we're right there, right? Now this works in two minute intervals, but 1041, right? We've just crossed. So we crossed at 1040 Eastern Standard Time.
So here we are on the QQQ, just pulled that up. I wanted to mark that for everybody. So we see what happens at 1040, right? That's 1040 Eastern Standard Time. And we sell off sharply and that drives us to the low of the day. Now yields pulled back a little bit after that, right? So again, between 1039 to 1041, that's where we made that move. We made it at 1040. There we are at 1040. Exactly at 1040, we see a sharp sell off, a little bit of pullback, and we eventually hit our lows of the day. That's on the QQQ. Now, for those interested in what that translates to on zero DT options, that's what we're looking at the trade ideas for insider access when we're scalping these kind of things when, you when we talk about it. Uh, usually, we tend to cut off our zero DTEs but once we pass two o'clock, but just for that one move, not from 4%. 4% would have been on the yield, would have been the start of the day. But what that would translate into, just if we were looking at the 1040, right, which is right here, that's gonna be 40 cents, right? And we tend to not trade in anything under 40 cents. That's that's kind of my minimum. I don't do the whole 10 cent contracts, five cent contracts. I'll explain in another, another video. But we like to look at at least 40 cents. What that would have been on that one move from 1040, okay? So you run up to 92 cents. So you're already over 110. You're about 100, um, 125% there on that one move. And of course, you peak out. This is a little bit higher and you peak at about 400% there with a 300% ROI. Now, we wouldn't have taken this from the from the very open because the contract prices are too low, but this is just isolating that one move, not at our 4%, not at 4.05% on the 10 year yield, but at 4.1%, 120% move there. And of course, if you hold some runners to the end of the day, you get up to $1.60 from a 40 entry. Now, if you're going from earlier, we would have used the 377, right? Because it's more in our price range, uh, 50 cents. Like I said, we start at 40. The, the next strike uh, down, you're gonna see it's at about 30 cents, so it's a little bit too low for us. But if you're running from open, you're open at 50, ce um, 50 cents, you run up to almost 400 to $4, not $400. Well, actually, the contract would be $400 if it's $4, because it's times 100, right? But you're looking at just under 800% on that move, 700% ROI plus. So it would have been different plays depending on how you're using it. And then of course here you would have scaled out, taken some size off, taken some size off, maybe leave some runners on, scale out, pull back. You're not gonna time it exactly, but the magnitude of the trade here is just under 800%. And really on the 374 for that one move, you get a smooth ride up, maybe you take a little bit of size off here, you get a smooth ride up to 120%. So you could see how substantial those moves are that we're going over on the chart. So I'm gonna switch right back to the chart now. Let's look at the SPY, right? Because you would think if it was other and it's other, um, if it's super technical and there's other reasons and it's not yield related, maybe they'll diverge. We've seen the SPY and the QQQ diverging a little bit. I put a post up the other day on how they diverged. They won't move so perfectly in tandem. Maybe it's gonna be different securities. Well, let's see here. So 1040, where are we? Right here, right? 1040, and then we, sell off, pull back, pull back, drive down to lows at the end of the day. But you could see that sharp move from 1040. If you're just scalping this with an insiders, you know, this was our move. This is a big move. You're holding runners, you get that opportunity through to the rest of the day, but triggers, we bounce up, hit that mark, and we go from 451, we're down to 450, 40. Now, of course, you see more volatility on the QQQ, right? Because then we go from 376, down to 373 and you know on zero DTE, zero day trading, that is a huge multi-point move, right? Um, and so that's something when you're looking at and evaluating the markets, you wanna to try to understand everything. So I hope everybody understands, just to those of you who are not part of Insider Access, uh, the point is more so to understand the full markets, right? You got the negative catalyst uh, piling up. You have that overly bullish sentiment, you have the breath drying up, you have the first and last out principle. Um, you see stretched valuations. Okay, so we're primed to make a move to the downside, right? That doesn't mean that you will, but then you have ADP data, and if it comes in hot, and it came in very hot today, right? We're in a three handle, 300,000 handle, versus a one handle expected, meaning it should have been in the 100,000s, high 100,000s. That's a huge hit over top. And if you look at the last ADP data, though they've been off on non-farm payroll, so they've been inaccurate, it impacted the markets and the markets didn't recover until CPI data came out. We didn't get that true breath returning. They're the European managers who are out, we have more vacations. And then of course, we see the yields climbing today. We're keeping an eye on it. So all of it factors in, storm, sell-off. And this was just at 4.1. So keep that in mind. 
where we started, 4.0, then 4.05, and 4.1, just hitting leg after leg after leg. Again, you see the same kind of look on the SPY, right? Because if you look at what we're talking about, talking about keeping an eye on the 4%, the 4.05, and the 4.1 threshold for the 10-year triggering, triggering market sell-offs. So we hit that in the morning, sell-off, 4.05, sell-off, and then we broke to 4.1 pretty quickly thereafter, sell off, and we bottom out for the day. And that's the heavy pressure on, so you can understand the role that yields play. Um, but again, there's multiple factors. Like I say, don't be married to one. There's technical, there's options flow, there's fundamentals, which are critical, because at the end of the day, why do you buy something? Because the company's gonna give you a good return, right? And you wanna get your money back. So the fundamental matters is extremely important. And then blending it all together for day trading, and in the current market environment and scenario, we felt that this was the appropriate number to draw people out of their positions and have them move over to take some risk off, given what we see. Is 4.0 and 4.1 always gonna trigger market selling? No, because there's a point at which you feel that you're getting better value out of the stocks you buy, right? So for example, I'm just gonna give you a really easy one. Maybe I don't like Tesla at 259. I'd rather put my money into a 4.1% because I'm not confident I can get the same kind of gains. Well, what if Tesla was $150, right? Or say half of this, let's say 125 instead of 450, uh, sorry, 250. Well, yeah, then I'm not gonna sell off and go into the 4% or 4.1. I'm gonna put my money in Tesla because I feel very confident that I can get the return. So that's the part where I say the valuation matters. You don't just pull money out and switch it over. So combining it all together is what's gonna make you successful. I know it's not the like fast track, um, but we've had a lot of great ideas. Another idea that we had with an insider uh, yesterday, of course, we're gonna talk about this a little bit more, is we said, we'll have some buying early in the morning. That was my final note. I said, look for some buying. We had, a, we had an upgrade. Uh, you could see that the adjusted price targets, we saw some adjusted price targets. We have some upgrades. Um, we have some maintains. We see targets at about 300. So I said, look for some early buying pressure on CAT and then we're gonna sell, we're gonna take our short position. So that short position was successful. I'll talk a little bit about that with the insiders. Um, that may be something that we're still working through. And uh, Google was another one where we went short. Of course, uh, Google's in a fantastic position. So both of those, but again, to those who are new and just learning and maybe not part of insiders right now, it's understanding and, and combining the valuations, right? Would I take a short position on something like Google if it was at $120? No, or CAT, no. Would I have cared about the 4.1% threshold today if the market wasn't where it was at? No. So combining all the factors, having a better understanding, it's not the shortcut, but it takes the markets from being this sort of guesswork and roller coaster of like, oh, I got it, this technical pattern worked out and everything works, oh, I don't know why it didn't work and pulling your hair out. There's nothing more hopeless than feeling like you're guessing and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Understanding why the markets work, even when you're wrong, but understanding it, that's where you get empowered and that's where you could build a long and successful career uh, or endeavor in the markets. Knowledge is power. Okay, hope that was helpful. Insiders, stay tuned. We are gonna pivot and move right into our uh, deeper analysis and look at a few other items.